ऑनरेबल प्रोफेसर पीटर कॉम्बा रिस्पेक्टेड वाइस चांसलर प्रोफेसर बी जे राव एस्टीम स्पीकर रिस्पेक्टेड फैकल्टी मेम्बर्स डियर स्टूडेंट्स एंड गेस्ट गुड आफ्टरनून ऑल एंड वेलकम टू द आई ओ ई डिस्टिंग लेक्चर ऑन क्यूरियोसिटी ड्रिवन फंडामेंटल साइंस इनोवेशन एंड ट्रांसफर एक्साम्पल्स फ्रॉम मेटेलायन बेस्ड केमिस्ट्री आई अनु एंड आई निकिता we stand before you with great pleasure and a deep sense of honor as we assemble here for 2024 distinguished ioe lecture program on behalf of school of chemistry university of hyderabad and the entire academic community i extend a warm and sincere welcome to each one of you now it's time to invite all our dignitaries to pre, uh, to grace the dais This event opens a new chapter in our quest for knowledge and academic success. The distinguished lecture program is a lighthouse that points us in the direction of intellectual discourse, innovation and discovery. Today we are privileged to host Professor Peter Komba, senior professor at Institute of Inorganic Chemistry, University of Heidelberg. whose profound contributions towards understanding the key processes involved in coordination chemistry by designing ligands to control the complex formation and stability has left an unfading mark in the field of chemistry with great pleasure i would like to invite honorable vice chancellor professor b j rao university of hyderabad for the inaugural address sir good afternoon to all especially to peter komba because he is going to he is going to sort of stimulate us into curiosity driven research and then quickly take us into metal ion chemistry so there will be a very interesting transition in that um i really want to warmly welcome the team from heidelberg and i see that there are good uh, pals sitting here who know these five gentlemen very very well four gentlemen very very well so it's good to have a union of known friends um this is a visit from uh, uh, heidelberg which is facilitated by subur bakht who is uh, our our linkage chemical bond linkage between heidelberg system and indian systems he is sampling lot of indian uh, you know prominent faculty members to set up interesting collaborations between india and heidelberg i think that is one point agenda so um, i don't want to talk too much it's a very interesting uh, uh, distinguished lecture awaiting us so uh, let us welcome the team and let's start the business thank you Moving on I am pleased to invite Professor Debashish Barik Faculty School of Chemistry to introduce our guest of the program Okay I hope I I am audible Um as you already know the today's uh, distinguished lecture will be delivered by Professor Peter Kamba uh, he is um, currently a senior professor at the University of Heidelberg and uh i'll give you a brief overview of his uh, research career many of you already know uh, his work uh, but uh, for the uh, general audience i'll give you just a brief introduction to it uh, he received phd uh, from university of uh, new settle in switzerland then after a brief postdoc in uh, australian lasallian university and university of lausanne uh, he started his career as lecturer at the university of basel and in 1992 he became full professor and joined at the university of heidelberg and since then he is a professor and in 2022 he became a senior uh, professor there uh, apart from his academic uh, uh, huge academic contribution in broadly in inorganic chemistry and um, also in uh, molecular modeling computational chemistry 
He also served in various capacities at the University of Hyderabad. Um, his main uh, focus of research has been in the areas of transition metal coordination chemistry, theoretical inorganic chemistry, and molecular modeling. Uh, the main goal of uh, his research work is synthesizing compounds with specific uh, electronic property properties, reactivities, and thermodynamic properties. He uses both experimental as well as computational techniques. Particularly, uh, he used force, force field calculation and density functional theory uh, for his research. He is highly prolific researcher. Over a span of four decades of his research career, he has published more than 350 research papers in various reputed international journals, published several books on molecular modeling, structure function correlation, and electronic structure theory. With this brief uh, note, I uh, now is the lecture, right? Okay, now I invite Professor Kamba for his lecture. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, thank you very much for your very nice uh, introduction, over generous. The older you are, the longer the introductions get, or maybe the less you have to, you have to talk about. Uh, anyway, so, uh, and thanks very much for uh, having me here. Uh, thank you for organizing uh, this, uh, this event. I'm, I'm very, very happy to be back in India. Uh, back in Hyderabad, and uh, I mean it's a great chance for me to be here. So thanks a lot. Um, so I just start with a couple of <coughs> couple of remarks. Um, so the first one is that I'm interested in uh, fundama fundamental science. So I basically just want to further knowledge. And I think this is very important. This is a cultural, a cultural thing we have to do. And I mean, for for a long time, uh, I I only thought about uh, you know have fun to ask the right question and look for sort of uh, uh, the right methods, the right approaches to get to answers. But then I also realized that oops, sorry start to get used to it. I also realized that um, society is very important because science is very expensive. I use a lot of money for my research and you as taxpayers are paying for it. Um, so everyone in the, in the street is paying for it and I have to give, give them something back. Okay? It's not enough just to sort of um, do science for furthering knowledge, um, but if there is a possibility to get to an application, one should be open to this. So that's, I learned that uh, only uh, later in my life, but I think it's uh, something of important. Now the third thing, which is important for me, it's important for me to tell you here, is that different cultures are doing science in a different way. I mean, um, you have your history, you have your religion, um, you have your uh, families, your way of life, and this is educating you also how you approach science. And if I understand how you do it, then I can learn a lot, uh, learn a lot, learn a lot from it. So it was always important for me to go abroad, to talk to people from other cultures, and also to have uh, people from other cultures in my, uh, in, my, uh, in my research group. I actually should tell you, I mean, I've reduced now to five co-workers, two postdocs and three PhD students. So from the three PhD students, two are Indians, and from the two postdocs, one is Indian. Um, and I think this is very good. I mean, uh, my German co-workers can learn a lot from them, I can learn, learn a lot from them, and we hope that they can learn something from us. Okay, um, I just wanted to tell you something about uh, possibilities for collaborations. 
for each change of, uh, of uh, students and my colleagues will uh, tell much more about that. Um, when you see uh, more what my colleagues are doing when they talk about their research, I just wanted to mention two initiatives in which I am involved. And uh, the first one is uh, CALA, so this is Catalysis Research Lab, which is half financed by the university and half by industry, by BASF. And we have um, 10 postdocs and one PhD student. I look after the PhD student. And as you already can see from the pictures, we always have one or two uh, Indian uh, colleagues among them. And the second uh, thing which I quickly wanted to mention is um, our new uh, Max Planck School. So this is a um, joint school between Max Planck Society and universities in Germany. Um, uh, ours, uh, it's called Method to Life, uh, is a direct track master PhD course. We have uh, 20 students every year, and uh, we have just finished uh, selecting the ones for, uh, for next year. And again, as you can see from uh, the students of the last couple of years, I mean, we always have some really good students uh, around them. And <clears throat> tell you again, this is not only a chance for the young Indian scientists who come to us, it's also a chance for us because they are very well educated, uh, very nice scientists, and um, very creative, and um, we can learn from their culture. So now, come to uh, some of uh, my research, fundamental research. Uh, this is a project which I, uh, which is just finished from my first Master to uh, Make to Life uh, PhD student. So. Um, some 20, 25 years ago, uh, colleagues of mine in Australia um, have looked at these as seedians, so they are sea, uh, sea squirts, uh, sessile on the barrier reef, so out on the Heron Island you find them, and they have extracted these type of uh, molecules from, from these uh, sea engines. And um, it's very interesting, if you look at that with uh, the eyes of a coordination chemist, you think that must be a macrocycle where some metal ions can coordinate. And I would coordinate the couple and these three nitrogens and another couple on these three nitrogens. And we have done quite a lot of uh, um, coordination chemistry in the last 20 years um, on, these, uh, on these species. And maybe this is a uh, well, it's an equilibrium between lots of different species. This one, the most interesting one. Uh, if we do this chemistry under inert atmosphere and open the vessel, uh, then uh, some carbonate is coordinated uh, to, so there's two couples sitting here, as I, uh, as I told you before. And uh, it's bridged by a carbonate. And this carbonate is coming from CO2 of the, from the air. Now the structure is um, determined by EPR spectroscopy, which you can see here. The simulation is very nicely reproduces the experiment, and this gives you the couple couple distance and the relative orientation of the of the coordination planes, and then you can do some EFD calculations to um, optimize the structure. Look at the EPR spectrum again. Let's see. So this is the structure of this carbon alpha complex. And what Philip, my student from Maple to Life, has done, he has um, selected some of these elements. Um, he has taken their cells, and their frozen cells um, uh, were used uh, to do some exafs. And the exafs, uh, so this is the body line, uh, and the data fitted with this structure very well reproduces the experimental line and telling us that in the cells of these animals we have this carbon out of bridge uh, like a couple of two species. But again, we have done some EPR in the cells. And then we have done some kinetic experiments and it turns out that um, the hydrolysis of CO2 to carbonate 
which then is coming out. So this catalytic groups, the catalytic cycle. And um, uh, so this is a carbonic anhydrase. And uh, this carbonic anhydrase is a sort of modern system where the usual carbonic anhydrases are mononuclear zinc complexes. So this is uh, unknown so far as, a, as, a, as an enzyme. And um, uh, it's only about one order of magnitude uh, slower than the unique, uh, human uh, carbonic anhydrase in the However, um, my uh, student has also measured the pH in this acidian. And this here is propyrrhol, so this is cyanobacterium, uh, which are the green spots. So uh, these two animals are living in symbiosis. It turns out that the pH in these species is around 7.5 or larger, depending on the daytime. And that uh, pH 7.5, the um, catalysis is inhibited, so this here stops with a carbon outer bridge uh, complex. We've also shown that by some PFP calculations. And uh, our current hypothesis, therefore, is that uh, this is not a carbonic anhydrase, but the capture CO2, uh, sorry, capture, well, capture CO2 transforms into carbonate and transports the uh, um, so I just can you hear me now is that everything okay okay so I just keep keep quiet um, what did I say I was saying that uh, our current hypothesis now is that um, these uh, carbonato bridge dicapper complexes are transporting the carbonate from the acidian to the cyanobacteria. Now the cyanobacteria do photosynthesis and they need the uh, CO2 for their uh, photosynthetic reaction. So that's our current hypothesis. And I mean, we have done lots of other experiments and that's all supporting it. Um, now, uh, this is purely academic. What can you do with this, you know? I mean, can you eat this? Can you feed people? Can you, you know? And, uh, well, we have not done anything so far. Um, and my time is limited, I should say. Um, but um, imagine that you uh, take this carbonate CO2 transporter um, and uh, put it to some other um, photosynthetic systems like algae and then you could use these uh, vehicles to harvest CO2 from the air it's too abundant anyway and you could use it to feed uh, the algae and produce some food for, uh, for that and uh, I mean I should say that uh, my student Philip has already done some experiments and uh, so they, these algae, they really like his food. They really like, uh, they start to, uh, to grow uh, together with his uh, couple of telemites. Okay, so uh, the next story I wanted to tell you, uh, so this is sort of my main story. I told you I have a very small group and my uh, one PhD student is um, taking care of high val valent non-heme iron systems um, so there's iron oxo, uh, iron oxo species, where are we? Um, like this uh, dye, iron, uh, dye iron centers, which are able to oxidize methane to uh, methanol. Selectively oxidize methane to methanol. And there's abundant uh, uh, methane in the air. This is also a climate gas. Can't use it for anything else than for burning. If you could sort of um, uh, make it to uh, methanol. Uh, methanol, uh, if you selectively could do that, methanol is a very important base chemical, quite expensive. You could, can use it for uh, many things. Now, um, we have used uh, model compounds. This is another enzyme, uh, Tau-D, 
with a mononuclear iron four uh, system and we make some uh, and other groups as well make some high valent iron four oxo species we use them for um, for example to um, um, oxidize well we can't really uh, oxidize methane. I think it would be strong enough, but there are some technical uh, problems in terms of solubility and things like that. So we use as a model, we use cyclohexane, which has nearly as strong CH bonds as uh, than methane. It's only about five kilocalories uh, smaller. Um, and uh, this iron oxo uh, rips off a hydrogen atom now a hydrogen atom is a proton plus an electron. The electron is going to iron 4 to reduce it to iron 3. And the proton is going to the oxo group to pro produce a hydroxo group. So this is the intermediate, an iron 3 hydroxo radical species, which then is doing rebu rebound, so-called so rebound um, um, mechanism, where the radical is recombining with the OH um, well, it could also recombine with the chloro group. I don't go into these details. And then that would uh, form um, methanol plus uh, the iron 2 species. So this is the second step. But the first step is the really, uh, the really um, hard one, the rate determining step. And um, you can ask yourself, uh, I mean, how can you make a catalyst efficient uh, to uh, really be able um, to um, oxidize very difficult to oxidize species like uh, cyclohexane. So one thing is the driving force, and this is related to the redox potential of iron uh, iron four. Oops, of iron four to iron three. Um, so this is the redox potential, and the second thing is uh, you have to transfer from. Uh, uh, intermediate or low spin uh, surface to a high spin surface to go through this transition state here. And uh, this is um, sort of facilitated by uh, spin orbit coupling. And the closer these two states are, the smaller the quintet triplet gap is, uh, the faster the reaction is. And we have sort of optimized our system in that way. Um, so this is our system, this is the ligand we are using, this is the complex, and as I say, I'm not going really into detail. Uh, we just figured out that we can create a really high redox potential and a really small quintet uh, triplet gap, and both uh, due, uh, due to this, uh, the structure of this ligand. So this is the rate which we are getting for the iron chloro complex, as you see it here. So this is really fast. This is uh, 750 or so. And uh, if you look through this, this is the record, basically. OK? Uh, now, I should say, uh, well, this is nearly as fast. But this reaction was measured at plus 20 degrees. I was measured at uh, minus 90 degrees. Again, the enzymes are measured at room temperature around. It depends. The room temperature now in Hyderabad is different from Heidelberg. But anyway, so it's around, uh, around room temperature, I would say. And uh, there's a difference here from um, over 100 degrees. And this is a factor of roughly 250. Now we have to go into detail. So this would be 250 times faster. So this would be something like t 10 to the fifth. So this is really, really, really fast. Now, I should tell you, I'm not, I'm not interested in records. I'm interested to understand why is this, this so efficient? Uh, how can I make it more or less efficient? And um, well, without going into details, um, I think we have um, solved some of the problems, but not all. So for that reason, I still need to work a couple of years. Um, uh, so some problems are still pending, um, but then again, I ask myself the question now, what, what can you buy with this? I mean, how can you support society with something like that? Now, I should tell you some 10, 15 years ago, we had a collaboration, I stopped some 10 years ago, and we had nearly 10 years collaboration with um, 
company with Unilever, and they produce some bleaching catalysts, okay? So you can put some tomato sauce on your white shirt, and then um, put some of these catalysts in your, in your washing powder, and you get the white shirt again, okay? Um, now, it turned out that um, our compounds, and this is a derivative of what I've shown you before, are the most efficient of these uh, bleaching catalysts. And uh, so I was very happy. Um, but it turned out, I mean, the company built, built a pilot plant, and then when, it, when they really should have invested some money uh, to pr produce things, uh, they skipped the project for business reason. I mean, well, I was very sad about it. Um, I don't think that I would have earned a lot of money. But I could come to Hyderabad, spill some curry on my, on my, on my uh, shirt, and wash it, go to the shop, buy some washing powder, and have my chemistry in there. And I'm very, very sad that I can't do that. Okay, so I still can make this compound and put it in the washing powder of my wife. I mean, she's not so happy about that, but uh, it works. Anyway, so um, then some uh, later, a friend of mine, he was working with Unilever, and uh, he stopped there and made a startup uh, to uh, use exactly the same compounds to. Um, uh, for some uh, paint drying, so if you paint your wall, uh, then uh, you make sure that it dries before it drops to the floor. And uh, it turned out that uh, this, this is uh, dried with our catalyst and this is dried with um, uh, another catalyst. So I believe this looks nicer. And uh, so these people make a lot of money. Uh, Without me, of course, because uh, the invention uh, to dry paints is not, uh, I mean, this was not coming from me anyway. Um, I am in contact with this company because they uh, uh, want to improve um, uh, their catalyst. I, I'm not sure that I, I can do that. But uh, anyway, so um, again, this comes out from some fundamental <coughs> research and, um, and uh, can do sometimes something uh, which serves society quite well. Um, <clears throat> so this is sort of my favorite uh, example. Um, you know the Irving Williams series, published 1948 in Nature by Irving and Williams, fully empirical. You take whatever ligand you want from left to the right, the stability constants increase, take EDTA, take macrocycles, take ethyl and diamine, cut the holes, everything uh, has sort of the same curve. Then you have a maximum at couple two, and it decreases slightly to sink two. But anyway, whatever you do, your sink two complexes are more stable than the couple two complexes, uh, sorry, than the manganese two complexes. And um, sort of, um, uh, both zinc, zinc and manganese are abundant in, in our body, and nature can do that. Nature can capture copper for a copper enzyme and zinc for a zinc enzyme. Now, I don't fully know the, the, these mechanisms, but I just couldn't believe that um, it's impossible to make a manganese uh, selective ligand. And so we just set up, uh, set out some five years ago, seven years ago, started uh, and made, which I believe is the first manganese selective ligand. Now the idea behind this that, uh, well, the difference between manganese and zinc is manganese is much larger than zinc too, okay? So the bonds from manganese to nitrogens are something like two point two angstroms from zinc, it's something like 2.0 angstroms. So that's a, a big difference. And so uh, we hypothesized to have a, a ligand with a large cavity, which is very rigid, does not uh, sort of uh, s uh, change the size. And then we wanted to uh, put some extra ligands on there. So this is a heptadentate ligand. 
and we thought that all arms would fit to manganese and uh, zinc because zinc is sitting right in the back of this ligand uh, so uh, one arm would for steric reasons then just fall off and not coordinate, uh, coordinate to zinc and so a zinc uh, um, pyridine bond is something like 150 to 200 kilojoules per mole um, so this should be 100 or so kilojoule per mole less stable than the manganese complex so you stabilize the manganese and you destabilize the zinc complex and really it works so this is uh, an overlay of structures of three such ligands so the blue one with the pyridine is the blue one here um, then the red one has a carboxylate here so blue one has an, a pyridine the red one has a carboxylate and then uh, we have seen that for those two, we have an extra eight ligand, so this is octa-coordinate, uh, which is coordinated to manganese two, and uh, so we also made an octadentate ligand, and this is shown the yellow one, uh, it's fully encapsulating the, the manganese. This is sort of uh, strange, we did not really expect that it's uh, uh, eight coordinate, but uh, for, for good luck it really is. Um, and uh, yes, I mean it works. Uh, here you can see um, from the octadentate ligand the stability constant log k value is 25 for manganese and 15 for zinc 2. This means this is 10 to the 10th time more stable uh, as a manganese complex than as a, as a zinc 2 complex. So it really works. Um, now, this is pure academics. And uh, it's also just a pure academic thought. If you then take this manganese complex, now this is the, the one with the pyridine, with the triflate coordinated. If you dissolve it in water, you will get uh, an aqua complex, so uh, same structure with just the water coordinated to it. Now this water would have just uh, quite a long bond and you would have very fast water exchange. And um, this reminded us that uh, for magnetic resonance imaging, um, as contrast agent you usually have uh, gadolinium-3, it's also highly paramagnetic, gadolinium-3 has 7 unpaired electrons, Manganese 2 has 5 um, and you have also by the, uh, in the gadolinium contrast agents what you need is a coordinated water which has fast water exchange. Now um, there are about well, nearly 100 million MRI scans per year internationally and about 60% are done uh, with contrast agents and 90% of these um, um, contrast agents used are gadolinium, usually gadolinium dota. Uh, so this uh, 50 million MRI scans with gadolinium dota, okay? Um, now the problem with gadolinium is it's toxic. But this is not the real problem. I mean, you, uh, you, you give these patients millimolar solutions of uh, which is a lot um, uh, of the contrast agents, but the gadolinium complexes are not, uh, are not toxic. I mean, they are excreted from the body through the uh, kidney um, uh, bladder uh, within an hour. Okay, you have to do your MRI scan quite quickly. And then the complex is going out and they have very high stability constant. They don't lose the, the free gadolinium ions, which would be toxic. However, people found out in five, five, six years ago that people with kidney problems, um, well, where the sort of the excretions is uh, facilitated, um, they got sick uh, and they had some fatalities of ki uh, people with kidney problems because then the, the gadolinium complex is staying longer in your body and uh, then uh, it could leach the free gadolinium. And also they have seen some uh, MRI scans from uh, people um, 
without contrast agent who had a couple of uh, MRI scans before they found some gadolinium in their brains, which is not so funny, okay? So uh, people want to get rid of, uh, of uh, gadolinium and we thought uh, maybe our manganese complex could uh, be quite useful. Now, you should be careful. Free manganese is also, is also toxic. But it's different from uh, free gadolinium because my body has some enzymes which are manganese enzymes. So ma uh, manganese is an essential metal ion and uh, my body knows how to deal with free ma manganese. It doesn't know how to deal with free, free uh, uh, gadolinium. So um, this is just with one of the ligands, um, a mouse picture. Uh, with uh, our manganese complex, and this is uh, the same picture, the same concentrations with uh, uh, gadolinium dota, and I mean you can say you can see the same things, you know. I mean the manganese is, if, if anything, better than not worse uh, than uh, the pictures with uh, with uh, gadolinium, and sort of the um, main parameters telling you about that is the real activity. So here you see the water exchange rate. It's really, really fast uh, with manganese, but the, the manganese, uh, sorry, the manganese water bonds are a little bit longer than the gadolinium water bonds. So the real activity is nearly the same. So one could use in future, and this would be sort of an application of a really um, um, a result which is coming out of pure curiosity. Uh, how can I beat the uh, Irving Williams series? So one could really uh, apply that. And I think um, society deserves that, that, when, that we turn, on, our, uh, turn on our brain after having done the academic research and think about what one could do with one of our, uh, the other of our, of our products. Uh, well, this is sort of a repetition what I've said uh, before, except for this uh, sentence of, uh, of uh, Linus Pauling, who said every aspect in, of the world today, so this today was 1984, even politics and international relations is affected by chemistry. Well, he died some 10 years ago. I can't ask him again uh, what he really means with this. Um, but I can see uh, even international relations that we as chemists, um, we as scientists, chemistry is influencing the international relations because it's making a happy man out of me, giving me the chance to come uh, to Hyderabad and uh, talk with you about, uh, about our chemistry. Now, um, our chemistry means that uh, many people have been contributing to them. So this is my group um, five years ago. Uh, now it's reduced to five people. Um, I don't have a current photograph. But you can see one uh, of my Indian uh, co-workers, Vel Murugan, a uh, postdoc, was already there then. Um, and these two people have done the iron work. This uh, is the patellamide, the diver. Um, and uh, Patrick, he has done uh, the manganese work. And I'm very happy about uh, people who helped me uh, in collaborations, and you can see that a couple of them are from India as well. I'm very, very grateful to my university to support us financially and by giving us space. Uh, the German Science Foundation, Max Planck School Matter to Life, and uh, some others, and uh, Carla, I've uh, told you about this, and I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, sir. It was really wonderful and an insightful talk. Now the session is open for discussion. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. I just didn't know whether whether uh, this is the idea. I'm sure. I mean, I'm I'm happy to answer questions.
So curiosity and capital, I think, have come together in this uh, very short talk by Professor Peter Pompa. Yes, some of that. You can just speak loud. I mean, okay. Actually, order. I'm curious, like you know, bleaching axel of iron uh, oxo compound, iron oxido hydroxy compound. The bleaching axel would work in a high oxygen state, iron core. Yeah. Oxo. So, uh, do you think you have to have some? Significant electron except like hydrogen peroxide, something to complete the bleaching accent. Catalysis. Sorry, I didn't fully understand. Uh, I think that <coughs> the, the bleaching accent to maintain, yeah. you need to add some oxidizing agent like hydrogen peroxide. Well, we, I mean, to do this chemistry, nature uses dioxygen. Okay. Then, so, that's uh, the oxidizing agent. If right, so it's. Uh, it's uh, Iron 2 is uh, oxidized to iron 3 by dioxygen to an iron 3 superoxo compound and then uh, the superoxo compound extracts some hydrogen to make some iron 3 hydroperoxo which then is a uh, splitting uh, overleaking data for O bond to an iron peroxo. Okay? So In the bottom system this does not happen because uh, our redox potentials are not um, allowing to reduce um, um, the dioxygen to superoxide. So the way we are doing it usually is by using peroxide, uh, as you uh, as you said, and then we go directly to the iron three peroxide complex. Or we do uh, we use also transfer reagents like iodosobenzene or peroxide or something like that to clean the. Uh, uh, made the iron for This can be also used in the paper industries, no? Paper bleaching paper. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually, the uh, my my friend uh, who made this uh, this um, um, uh, paint drying uh, chemistry, so he has sold his patent and got the new startup, and uh, he's interested now in uh, in uh, bleaching uh, bleaching uh, wood to. Uh, to some nice thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other uh, queries, questions from yes, Kal? Yes. Uh, Professor. Ah, oh, so, sorry. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, second part of your talk, where uh, the rate is uh, controlled by uh, uh, quintet triplet gap. Right. Uh, so this is a general question. I, I just wanted to get an idea about. Uh, what is the minimum gap and what is the maximum gap that you could control through the chemistry? Who? Uh, now, in sort of in nature, the the quintet gap is lower. Uh, sorry, the quintet state is lower than the the triplet state. Mm -hmm. So this is what people think is ideal. Yeah. Now, in our case, it's, it's uh, the other way around. Yeah. Now in this system with a chloro complex, um, the gap is around uh, 1,000 or 1 to 2,000 wave now course, okay? And uh, so this would already be in an area where you could do some uh, some uh, spin crossover, temperature dependent spin crossover. It's actually something we, which we are trying. It's not so trivial. Um, and uh, I mean the gaps are sometimes usually uh, there are ten thousand wave numbers or something like that. Is there any way because the, the, the relative uh, spin state ordering would be controlled by the electron electron repulsion? So is there a way to switch it back to make the quintet lower than? Yeah, uh, I mean I think it's. Well, it's in my in my picture of ligand field theory. Um, it is a dx square minus y square orbital, which you have to decrease in energy, and for that you just um, choose the right ligands. I mean, uh, you know, if you quickly go back to this slide, I guess. Oops. Ah, here, here we are. So, um, now here you s you you see our our compound. 
So the dx square minus y square, so this is a set axis where the oxo group is, and the dx square minus y square is, uh, well, these three nitrogen and the next group. And um, so you need to decrease the dx square. Can I? I mean, I'm, I'm talking. Do we have an end where I can grow here? No, you don't. Now, I don't want to destroy your wall. Uh, anyway, so um, um, and you can control the energy of the dx square minus y square orbital by changing the ligand x. Okay, so we go from amine to acetonitrile to uh, chloride to bromide, and uh, so we decrease uh, continuously the dx square minus y square and uh, sort of. Uh, uh, by decreasing uh, the dx square minus y square, we also decrease the, the, um, the gap between the triplet and the quintet state. Okay? Thank you. The one, this is also takes me to the first part, which is again a very general question. So you are uh, transporting um, um, carbon ions and uh, depositing carbon dioxide. Yeah. Now, carbon ion is a large anion. Yeah. And as compared to, let's say, halides or any other. So, in your opinion, in general, and just for a general question, uh, you know, in your opinion, the transport of large anions, does it differ significantly in mechanism from the small anions? The transport. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, you just have different transporters. I mean, with uh, these systems uh, which we have uh, here, okay, uh, so this dicapo 2 complex, you, you would have a problem to transport a small, a smaller anion, okay? So, because this is quite large, but then you just need a different transporter. Yeah, yeah, right, right. It has some flexibility, you know. I mean, uh, so, sort of can can bend it here to some uh, to some extent. I mean, we have also, and I I uh, showed you that on here. So when we look at the whole equilibria, we have also a hydroxyl bridge dicapo two complex. So then it's just sort of folding a little bit more more together. So could even think of a chloride could also be bridging between uh, between these two uh, couples. And there's one thing, of course, I mean, if you feed these animals with um, the CO2, then uh, these couple complexes are sitting in the cells of the cyanobacteria. So they have to bring the copper out again. And the question is how they do that. I mean, that would be the next question. Okay, and I guess I mean this is just with different anions like chloride or, you know, if they do photosynthesis, they pro produce some phosphate, and they could uh, I mean you need to to transport the copper out of the cells again, otherwise they die. Could you go back to the slide where you were showing the CH activation, the one uh, you had okay. before you? Yeah, no, the one. Up. This one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my question was, uh, is this uh, catalyst complex uh, specific for cyclohexane or uh, is it a very general catalyst and can oxidize, CH oxidize all kinds of substrates? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we use that, I mean, for uh, hydrogen uh, abstraction in, in different alkanes. Um, but you can also uh, use it for oxo transfer. So you can uh, oxygen transfer, uh, you can transfer this, uh, this oxo group to a double bond to make an epoxide, for example, or to a thioether to, for a sulfoxidation, mm -hmm. phosphine uh, oxidation, and so on. So it's, it's used for um, atom transfer reactions, uh, can make the similar nitrines, and you can uh, sort of uh, transfer the, the nitrogen uh, to make aceridines and things like that. So it's sort of uh, used for very different uh, oxidation reactions. Um, Do you get only cyclohexanone or you get 
the cyclohexanol and the chlorocyclohexane as well. Great. I mean, you are asking uh, interesting questions. I can now talk another hour about this, but you don't allow, I don't fear that. Um, so this is really, I mean, if you take the chloro complex, you, know, you can uh, have the rebound to the uh, alcohol or to the chloride mm -hmm. uh, to produce either the, the <coughs> chlorocyclohexane or the cyclohexanol. If you take the chloro complex, it's 100% selective for the, uh, for the chlorocyclohexane. Now, if you want to make the alcohol, you just put an acetonitrile there or, you know. Exchange the ligand. Right, OK. Uh, if you have a bromo here, then we make the bromocyclohexane and so on. Right. Very interesting. Uh, anybody else? Any questions, comments? <coughs> Well, if not, then uh, let's thank Professor uh, Peter Pomba with a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, so, in uh, appreciation uh, of the excellent lecture by Professor Peter Pomba, I would like to invite uh, Professor Kalida Sen, who is uh, the senior most alumni uh, of the University of Heidelberg in India. Uh, to kindly hand over uh, as our uh, appreciation. Uh, 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 yeah, you hear it. Kalidas, please. Sean and also the So there is a there is a beautiful tradition you buy us. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you Professor Kalidas. Yeah. So uh, we are coming to the uh, close of the uh, formal distinguished lecture. Um, this is a visit of the uh, German delegation, as was uh, mentioned uh, in the beginning. And uh, Dr. Subur Bakht, who is uh, based in uh, New Delhi, uh, is the leader of the delegation. Uh, we were running a little behind our time schedule and uh, people were eagerly waiting. So we didn't want to delay the start of the lecture. We have a few minutes. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Subur to kindly? Um, first of all, a big thanks to Dr. Nangia, Dr. Sain, and to Dr. Bijara for organizing this, for having us over. It's indeed a big pleasure because Hyderabad University, I would say, is like a second home. Uh, with, with long-standing cooperations with Heidelberg University. Um, the purpose of the visit, of today's visit is, it, we are fortunate we also have the Vice President of Heidelberg University, Andreas Roy, who's also a chemist, Oriol Lutz, and of course Peter Komba. So that, uh, the purpose is to look for opportunities for research cooperations, look for exchanges for students and for the faculty, and to set up projects. But before that, the idea is to know each other. So in, in the next phase, at, as the scientists would be presenting to each other, to, to know their, each other's research work and to come together, OK, this is the way we want to work in future. And, and we'll come to know, you'll come to know that there are a lot of funding opportunities from the German foundations, such as German Academy Exchange Foundation, German Research Foundation, and political foundation, and also the Indian funding agencies. There are a lot of... Um, bilateral calls that are available and there are also EU calls. We, have, we, we wrote Erasmus Swagata calls and were successful two times. So there are a lot of opportunities. So let's start and let's see how the cooperation talks uh, shape up and then we'll be in a figure to say that how do we take this forward. Thank you again. Uh, so thank you. Uh, the next round of uh, discussions uh, and uh, exchange interactions uh, will be in the uh, Vice Chancellor's conference room where we will continue. Uh, 
uh, it is uh, predominantly uh, given the uh, makeup of the uh, German group, it is predominantly chemistry based. Uh, anybody from the audience of course is welcome to share uh, what they have to offer in the template that we are trying to build uh, between the two uh, groups. So I now request uh, that we move to the uh, VC's conference hall, all of us who are present here from chemistry as well as anyone who is interested to join us. And uh, it would be incomplete if I did not thank the large number of people who are responsible for uh, arranging this uh, and organizing the distinguished lecture. First and foremost, uh, my apologies from all of us. Today is a day when almost all our staff are on leave because uh, they have gone for election duty training. Uh, so we are trying to run the entire campus uh, without any support staff. And so we are at also at a loss as to you know where the mic is and where the uh, marker pen is and so on. Uh, thank you to our wonderful students uh, who have pitched in uh, to introduce the speaker and the program, uh, Mr. Mr. Ashish Thomas and Mr. Arun and his PRO team, uh, the audiovisual uh, recording group, and all of you for making this a success. Thank you very much. So we move on to the Vice, Con Vice Chancellor's conference room from here. Thank you.